Hi everyone, this is Dr. Mike, and today we're going to talk about automatic flashes and some of the functions of those flashes. Now, I did a, probably my most popular video was something called uh, using a manual flash is easy. So if you want to know about using a manual flash, go back to that to that video. You can just find it in my, go click on my little name of my channel and, and, and search for it and you'll be able to find it. Uh, but today we're going to look at automatic flashes. And so let me tell you a little bit about my story and my history with automatic flashes. So in 2003, I bought my first electronic or my first digital SLR camera. It was a digital Rebel Kiss, also known as the 300D, six megapixels. I was really in hog heaven. Uh, and I was using that camera professionally and doing a lot of corporate work, inclu including a lot of headshots. But what I discovered was that the little flash on the camera really was extremely unflattering and gave just terrible shadows and kind of made people look not very good. And I knew I needed an external flash, but I knew nothing about them. And in fact, I had so little knowledge about digital cameras in those days that I was shocked to find that uh, external flash would be at least several hundred dollars. But I plunked down the money and I bought a Canon. I think it was a 430EX, if, I, if I'm correct. Um, I, they now have a 430EX version 3, so this was version 1. And when I looked at the back of the control panel, this is, not, this is a different flash, but it was similar, I saw all these buttons and was completely baffled. I try to read the manual, but manuals for flashes are written for people that understand flashes, not for novices like I was. And they're usually not only written poorly, but they have terribly small little little diagrams that didn't make any sense to me. And so I did for years, I hate to say it, I did all of my shooting in what was called ETTL mode, and I'll describe that in a moment. And it was only until I started using manual flashes off camera that I had enough courage to go back and understand what some of these other functions do. So today we're going to talk about those. So hopefully that you'll have that understanding too. Hopefully I'll do a good enough job. And when you look at a flash, there's really two areas that these automatic flashes do. Now, of course, every flash is different. Um, some flashes are not nearly as sophisticated as this one is, but many flashes are nowadays. Um, and so kind of look at your specifications when you buy a flash. We'll talk about things to look for just in the body of this discussion. But flashes, more modern flashes, basically have two functions now. They can either control the way the flash flashes, that's the first set of functions, or they can control the flash remotely. What does that mean? That means you take the flash off the camera and you put it on a stand someplace, you maybe have multiple flashes, and that allows for some really great lighting effects, some really great portrait effects. Uh, and in fact, when I moved into off the camera flashes, I did that with manual flashes, which is how I learned how to use manual flashes, which actually gave me the courage to go back and study these buttons on this flash or on flashes similar to this. So we're not gonna talk about remote stuff because that's a whole different topic. We're just gonna talk about some of the basic functions, the different ways that we can flash a flash, flash a flash, um, so you understand them too. And you're less afraid of them if it's kind of freaking you out. So the first way is usually the default way. So when I turn this flash on, Come on, Flash. Go on for me. There we go. It's going to open up in what's called ETTL mode, or, mode, or if it's a different brand of camera, TTL mode, which means through the lens metering. What that does is that the computer in the Flash and the computer in the camera communicate with each other um, and figures out what the right flash is. How much flash should it be? Should it be brighter or less bright to get the proper exposure? That often works very, very well. And since it's, all, it's, it's automatic, it's probably the way to go uh, in many instances, but not all instances. Now, sometimes you will do that, but if you're too close to the subject, especially if you're looking at a face, you're gonna blow out that face. It's just gonna be too bright. And so what you want to do then is use another function on the flash, and all flashes will have this, which is called flash exposure compensation. It's usually going to look like a little arrow with a plus and minus sign or something like that, like a little flash arrow. So if I press on my button, I, I get another little thing if I press on that, and I can control using the, the little dial here, I can control if I'm going to make the flash brighter from than what it thinks it is, or if I'm going to make it less bright. And often when I'm doing a portrait, I'm going to make it less bright by a stop or two. Um, and the flash then says, okay, I think the flash should be this bright, 
but I'm going to lower it by a stop or two or, or a stop and a half or whatever I need to do and make it less bright. And that way I get the perfect kiss of life, 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 the perfect kiss of light on the subject's face. I don't blow it out, but yet I give it a nice, a nice light. So they're evenly lit. So, so again, if you're using ETTL and if it's too bright or not bright enough, all you have to do is to go in that plus minus little arrow thing, adjust up or down, depending on your needs and you will have flash exposure compensation put into place and you will get either a little bit brighter or a less bright flash. Now don't forget, of course, in these kinds of flashes, if you have a white ceiling above you, you can also bounce that flash to get a nice shell, kind of like a, 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 like a showering of light. That works pretty well too. So that simple thing of just doing this works. But remember, you gotta have a white ceiling. You can't do it up in the sky. And uh, that ceiling can't be 20 feet above, like you're in some auditorium or something. It's got to be like, you know, eight feet, nine feet above you to get that effect. So that's the first thing to remember. And if all you learn is ETTL is the easiest thing to do and, and flash exposure compensation, adjust the flash up or down based on that ETTL setting, that is plenty to take away from this video. But wait, there's more. There's also other functions that your flash will do. So if I press on this again, there's a mode button usually. If I press on that mode button again, it's going to say M for manual. So manual kind of disconnects the computers between these two devices. And the only thing that the camera controls is when the flash flashes. So the power of the flash and all that is not controlled at all by the uh, by the camera. So what is that good for? Why would you want manual control? Well, sometimes uh, you can buy flashes that are just manual uh, and they flash just like any other flash. They're really cheap. And if you need to do multiple arrays of flashes, they're a great option because they're cheap and you can have several flashes flashing at once. Awesome. But there are times when you might even want to use manual control with a flash that has ETTL. Why would that be? Well, every time I use ETTL, the computer in the, in the flash and the camera are working together to give me the right exposure. And that can change a little bit. So if I was doing a series of headshots of a person, I could actually get variations in exposure. And if I'm doing, let's say, 20 or 30 headshots of that person, they're going to pick the right shot. I want them to all look identical with the exception of the pose, right? And to do that, I really need to use manual flash because that's going to always give the same amount of light every time. Now manual flash can be adjusted. The intensity can be adjusted. And again, I have that whole video on it. Just look in my video channel, search for using a manual flash is easy. But just for completeness sake, I can tell you that if I turn this on, I wonder why it's not, it's not, I wonder if I, there we go. It's on manual. And I can see in the back, see, it's, I don't know if you can see this, it's like one eighth. By turning this knob, I can adjust the strength of the flash from anywhere from full power all the way down to 128th power. So 128th, 128th less power than full power and anything in between. And that way I can dial in the first perfect amount of flash that I need for that particular task. Really handy to know. So again, manual flash, and adjust the power to what you need. That's all manual flash does. Well, there's another function on here that I never use. And this flash is called multi. It also might be called repeat or it might be called stroboscope, strobos, stroboscopic function. What that means is there are instances where if I wanted a very long exposure, maybe a second, two seconds, or three seconds, I could actually have the, the flash fire off a series of flashes and I could freeze action and get a picture that, let's say my hand was like this, you'd see my hand like this, like this, like this, like this, like this, you'd see all of those boom, 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 boom on one particular image. So that would be great for something or maybe someone was juggling or someone was tossing a ball, you'd see the ball like traveling across to the other person. Let me show you what they mean. So I have this set right now on, um, on four megahertz. That's the speed that this will flash will flash and it's seven flashes. So if I hit the flash, so I don't know if you heard that, but the flash, the, the shutter opened up and then it took seven flashes, boom, 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 seven, and then, then the shutter closed. All right. So if I had that, you, if let's say someone was throwing a ball, you'd see seven images of that ball as it traveled across the arc to the other person.
kind of a cute thing, something I probably don't have a need for, but you might, so I wanted to tell you about it. So what else can this do? Well, two other things that I want to talk about. Um, well, actually, I'm just going to talk about one of them because some cameras some cameras don't support the other. I'm going to talk about probably my favorite function of an automatic flash, and that is high-speed sync. And that on this particular flash, flash is achieved in a different way by pressing this little sync button here. If I press that, that little icon lit up, that has a little H on it for high-speed sync. What does that mean and why would you need that? It sounds very confusing, very fancy, um, but it's not so much if you understand it. So first you have to understand how shutters work. So in between here is the sensor, all right? My, my big nose there is the sensor, right? And what happens when I want to take a picture is there's two curtains, a bottom one and a top one, the shutter curtains. This shutter curtain comes down, all right? I press the button, it opens up, after the exposure is complete, the bottom one comes up and then uh, causes the image to lose light or the sensor to lose light, and we've taken our picture. But something strange happens at faster shutter speeds. You can't have the shutter completely open. So this one comes up, and then this one comes up. You can't have it completely open like that because the speed is just too fast. The shutter can't move that fast. So what happens is, as this shutter is going up, the bottom one, or the curtain, excuse me, when this cur curtain is going up, the bottom one is following it and then closes. So you get like lines. The shutter is never completely open at high shutter speeds. So the problem is, is that if I pick a very fast shutter speed and I want to use flash, either the camera will not flash because it knows that it can't do it, or if it does flash, I'm gonna see a band. Like some of the, some of the images are gonna be dark and some is going to be properly exposed because, again, that shutter, those curtains are moving up together, not completely open and completely closed. Well, that's a problem in some instances. And the time that we have when the shutter is completely open, the, the fastest speed that a camera can go is called the flash sync speed. So on this Canon camera, the flash sync speed is 1 200th of a second. If I try to do anything over 1 200th of a second with a flash, it's either not going to work, or if I force it to work, part of the image is going to be underexposed. On some cameras, it might be 1 80th of a second, or on some cameras like Nikon's, it might be 1 250th of a second. Well, that's great in most instances, but let me give you a scenario where I tend to use high-speed sync. I'm outdoors. I want to take a portrait of a person. I want the nice kind of blurry background in the back. So I want to use a wide open aperture. So I want to use a very wide aperture. It's going to let a lot of light in. Well, the only way that I can let that light in without overexposing the image is to use a very fast shutter speed. But remember, I can only use 1 250th of a second. And if I try to use that with that big wide aperture on a bright day, what I'm going to get is a completely blown out picture. But if I use high speed sync, I can get the camera to shoot at a higher, um, a higher, a higher sync speed, or in other words, a higher flat or higher uh, shutter speed, and get the proper exposure of the background, and yet illuminate the face like I want to with the flash. So how is, that, how is this magic happening? Well, what happens is very simple. When I put this flash on high-speed sync, and you won't be able to really see this when I do it, but I'll, I'm going to show you anyways. So I have this, oops, I don't want it on that. Uh, see, you press the wrong button. Okay, when I press the high-speed sync button, so let's say, let's say I take a picture. It looks just normal, right? It looks like it just, it looks typically normal. But what you didn't see is that instead of just having the flash flash quickly, usually a flash is going to flash at like one one thousandth of a second or even one ten thousandth of a second. It's going to fire like a series of little flashes, like, doo -doo 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 -doo, like zzz, you know, zzz, uh, you know, all in a row simulating a longer flash. So I can now simulate a flash that's going to last maybe one five hundredth of a second instead of the one ten thousandth of a flash that I would normally get. Um, so that way, I'm going to keep that flash going for the entire cycle of this little shutter opening and closing, and I can properly get a nice blurry background because I have a very wide aperture and still use a flash properly. So my recommendation, since I use that function all the time, if you are looking for a flash, 
you want, and you are going to get an, not just a manual flash, but one that has you know, some of the electronic features like ETTL, try to get one that has high speed sync for your camera. Now on a Canon camera, using high speed sync is as simple as just flipping a button on the flash. On Nikon cameras, you have to go in the flash menu and make some other adjustments. Again, look at your manual for that. Most camera, I mean, just about every camera brand, Sony and Olympus and all that, will allow high speed sync, but the way that you initiate that function may be different from camera to camera. So those are the functions that I wanted to show you on, on, a, on a modern uh, kind of external flash or speed light. Remember, the other set of functions refer to using the flash remotely off of the camera. There's a bunch of ways to do that. Maybe I'll make a video on that um, in the near future, but this is enough for now. So if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe to my channel. What makes me want to do more videos are thumbs up and subscribers because I think, well, someone's actually watching this. I want to make more videos. The other things that I would tell you about, I do some other uh, media sorts of things. I do a... Um, I do a blog page, drmikekuna.com, D-R-M-I-K-E-K-U-N-A.com. That's a lot of my personal feelings, a lot of my philosophy of life, a lot of things that are happening in my life, referring to my retirement, my kids, whatever. I think it's kind of interesting. You might not. And now what I've done, so I've, I've had an audio podcast for years. I've changed the format based on actually um, one of you guys. And what I changed it to is he said, gee, it'd be interesting if I could hear or, or see you actually do your, your blog in an audio format. So what I've done now is I'm doing a little experiment where I've, I'm now starting to record my blog in audio format and I'm broadcasting it on my podcast channel which is called Psychiatric Secrets um, and, and you can find it at psychiatricsecrets.libsyn.com um, and uh, or you can find it on Apple Podcasts and things like that too. So if you want to listen to any of those for me, it's great. Otherwise, I hope this video was useful for you. And as always, thank you so very much for watching my little videos and have a great day. Bye-bye.